Hello grade 10s. We have looked at some of the earlier models of the atom. From those held by the ancient Greeks, such as Democritus, through to Dalton's atomic model and how this model was replaced by the plum pudding model of Thompson, in today's lesson we will see how the atomic model changed as new discoveries were made. We will continue to explore the development of the atomic model. We will look at some of the key ideas and discoveries of Rutherford and his peers Hans Geiger and Ernest Marston and relate those to our description of the atom. The work done by these scientists provides a major contribution to what we know of the atomic model used today. Let's cross over to Dyasha and find out more about the development of the atomic model. I must introduce you to one of the most famous scientists in the early 20th century. Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was a big, friendly, hard-working New Zealander who had a passion for science and loved experimenting in the laboratory. He was particularly interested in the work that J.J. Thompson did, as well as in the work of Madame Curie, who discovered and isolated radioactive uranium. Because of his passion for experimentation, Rutherford conducted one of the most important experiments in the development of the atomic model. So, without further delays, let's meet the man. Hi, my name is Ernest. I studied under J.J. Thompson in England before moving to Montreal in Canada to begin my work on the alpha particle. I am rather proud to say that I, in fact, discovered the alpha particle. It was while I was studying the nature of the alpha particle in Canada that I first saw some experiment results that made me question the current theories we had about what the atom looked like. You see, I shot a stream of alpha particles through a rectangular slit onto photographic paper. This experiment was done in a vacuum. That means that all the air is removed from an enclosed container so that the air particles don't interfere with the results. The result was a neat, well-defined rectangle seen on the photographic paper. But to be sure, I repeated the experiment, only this time the alpha particles were passed through air, not in a vacuum. This time the rectangle on the photographic paper was broad and badly defined. Whoa! I asked myself, why this difference? The only explanation I could think of was that the alpha rays were scattered by the particles in the air the atoms of air. The alpha particles bounced off the air particles and got reflected away from their original straight path a little. That's why a fuzzy image was created and not so defined like the first experiment. Rutherford moved countries again, back to England, and continued his research work at Manchester University. During this time, Hans Geiger, another scientist, built a counter to count alpha particles. This counter would help tremendously in investigating the nature of the alpha particle. The annoying problem was that there was so much scattering of the alpha particles that no proper results could be collected. This scattering would have to be sorted out first before any more work on the alpha particle could be done. So a new experiment was begun to specifically investigate the scattering of alpha particles a new piece of apparatus was built. This apparatus had an energy source that provided the stream of alpha particles. The alpha particles were shot into a tube. A very thin piece of metal foil was strung across the tube. This is what scattered the alpha particles. A zinc sulfide screen was placed at the end of the tube. This flashed when it was hit by the particles. Scientists looked through a microscope to see the flashes on the screen. Still, the results they were seeing were strange. The alpha particles were scattering at large angles. After many experiments and rebuilding of apparatus and the addition of an apprentice, Ernest Marsden, another discovery was made. Occasionally, an alpha particle was reflected back towards the alpha particle source. Now this was truly bizarre. Rutherford had to explain this to the world and he wasn't quite sure what was causing such strange behavior. Finally, he decided that the behavior of the alpha particles must have something to do with the structure of the gold atoms. 
Now we need to think about the Thompson model again. Do you remember what it looks like? Yes, the plum pudding model. Remember this model compared the atom to a cake with plums scattered through it. Thompson had identified the negative particle and called it an electron. He knew that there must be a positive particle but could not find it. Remember, Rutherford was a student and a good friend of J.J. Thompson, and he was also loyal to his friend. So, Rutherford also believed that the atom was solid and that the mass of the atom was evenly spread throughout the sphere. But the experimental result he was getting told him a different story. Before Rutherford carried out this experiment, he predicted that the alpha particles would be scattered by the gold atoms making up the gold foil. He thought the alpha particles would bounce off the evenly spaced positive parts of the atom. But what results did Rutherford actually observe? Surprisingly, most of the alpha particles went straight through, as if there was nothing there. A few alpha particles were deflected, and a very very small number were reflected back towards the alpha particle source. Even though these results were unexpected, Rutherford accepted them. Instead of trying to squeeze the results to fit his own ideas, he looked at the results to tell him a story. There were three important deductions that Rutherford made from his results. All the mass of the atom is in the middle, not spread out evenly according to Thomson's model. He called the middle of the atom the nucleus. The nucleus is positively charged, just like the alpha particles. And the electrons were very far away from the nucleus. He thought they were moving around the nucleus, just like the planets orbit the sun. Rutherford was an exceptional scientist. He carefully analyzed his results and used these to change the world's idea of what the atom looked like even though it meant that he had to contradict the work of a good friend. Once Rutherford published his findings, the Thomson plum pudding model had to be replaced by the new Rutherford model. This model separates the atom into two distinct areas, the nucleus and the orbiting electrons. It is interesting to note that from this time forward, Scientists studying the atom were also divided into two distinct groups, the nuclear physicists who concentrated on the nucleus and the chemists who concentrated on the electrons. Despite the success of the nuclear atomic model, it raised some questions. For example, the atomic mass of an element was often twice as large as the atomic number. Rutherford could also not explain why the nucleus did not fly apart due to the electrostatic repulsion between protons. The first of these problems was solved by an English physicist who studied under Ernest Rutherford at Manchester University. His name was James Chadwick. Rutherford had predicted the existence of a neutral particle in the nucleus, but it was Chadwick who discovered it in 1932. The discovery of the neutron explained the differences in atomic number and atomic mass of an atom. Rutherford's nuclear model was an improvement on Thomson's plum pudding model. But Rutherford didn't discuss the exact arrangement of the electrons around the nucleus. He also could not work out why the electrons stayed in orbit. The nuclear model also contradicted experimental evidence of spectral lines. This problem was finally solved by a Danish physicist named Niels Bohr. You will learn more about his work in another lesson. To recap so far, we have traced the historical development of the atomic model and you have been introduced to the work of many scientists. You need to be able to identify five major contributions to the current atomic model we use today. Look at the task video for a question relating to Rutherford's experiment and his contribution to the atomic model. Remember to visit the Mindset website too. Thank you, Grade 10s, for joining us today. Until next time, take care.